quite fortunate situation of having been a cartoonist in the old era, in the old, during the old order, and being a cartoonist in the new order. And so it gives me a kind of a perspective. And let me just take you back to a time when there was no openness. This is a calendar poster for the United Democratic Front, which was the above-ground version, in a way, of the African National Congress. And uh, there are many of you who will remember it, and there are many here who are very young and who, <laughs> who won't have experienced so much about it. This, this calendar poster looks kind of innocuous, doesn't it? It's drawn in a very light style, but in fact, it was banned. It was banned for distribution. Uh, you were not allowed to distribute it, or you're not allowed to uh, sell it or give it out or whatever. I had to actually go, well, we actually applied for reasons to find out why it was banned, and it was for furthering the aims of a banned organization, which is the sort of catch-all phrase. I had to go into hiding. The security police came looking for me and for the calendar poster, and um, I eventually got a disguise. Uh, we dyed my hair. It, went, uh, it actually went orange instead of blonde. My, my wife assures me, my then girlfriend, but assures me that it was intentional. I mean, she knew that would happen. We had to re-dye it. It then went, it actually went blonde. I wore little glasses. But that's, the, that's where we came from. And I'm not going to dwell on that. What I am going to say is that it was incredible that through the opening up much quicker than we realized, and through incredible efforts of people who were struggling for freedom, the opening up of society, we suddenly were, and there's a lot that went in between, but suddenly there we were on the 27th of April, 1994, which is when that cartoon was, was drawn and when it appeared in the newspaper. It was a new openness. You see light and dark. You see the sun. You see Nelson Mandela's smiling, charismatic face, which was emblematic of not only the struggle that he had been so much part of and that he'd been at the, at the helm of, it was also emblematic of the suffering and it became emblematic of the new South Africa and of the new openness and of the new democracy. Nelson Mandela was an amazing leader, a man with huge integrity, huge principles, great leadership ability, tremendous charisma, but he wasn't perfect. And I did, of course, most of the cartoons I did about him were very, uh, were very much in praise of him, but I did a couple of critical cartoons when I saw him. In this particular instance, I thought he was favoring people who were struggle activists along with him and who were not performing. Uh, I felt that it was really bad. I did a cartoon, this one, saying, Drolli Klachla, the righteous. Uh, it's nothing serious, just the occasional slip halo. And... It was, a, it was almost a plea to him. It's an ironic use of the kind of saintliness of Nelson Mandela because, of course, we, we saw him almost as a, as, a, as a saint. But here there's a bit of an ironic use of that in saying, oh, look, you know, the halo can slip occasionally. Please don't let it slip. We, we need you to be as good as we know you are and keep on doing what you're doing. The good stuff. He, as I said, he wasn't perfect, but he, he embraced criticism. Now, let me tell you a little story that I have told many, many times, but it is so powerful for me that I thought I must tell you. So in 1998, I'm sitting at my board frantically drawing, which is what I do every day, and the phone rings, and my wife picks up the phone and uh, hands it to me, and, and a, a voice comes on and says, uh, a woman's voice says, uh, this is the president's office, um, hold on for President Mandela. So I thought, ah, it's one of my friends playing around. So I sit and I've got a pen in my mouth and another pen that I'm friendly. And then a voice comes and says, hello, as uh, that as a pero? I said, yes. And I wasn't sure. He says, ah, this is uh, President Mandela. And I said, well, it sounds like you, so it must be you. He says, I am very upset with you. So I thought, oh, my God. Now that the criticism is, <laughs> it's finally happening. He, he's starting to get angry about the criticism. And it turned out he just, he literally had phoned me because he saw that the cartoons would not be appearing in the Cape Argus, the, the reprints from the Sowetan, two different newspapers I was working in, 
when he was in Cape Town and he loved seeing them when he was in Cape Town. And he, I said to him, I cannot believe you actually phoned me yourself. And what makes it even more special is that you picked up the, the phone and phoned me after seeing, I had met him four years before. And I said, after seeing the cartoons over these last few years, getting more and more critical of the ANC and, and of government. And he said, oh, but that is your job. And that for me was the single most powerful moment that I've ever experienced as a cartoonist. And it gives me a lot of courage to keep doing what I do. When Nelson Mandela stepped down after one uh, term in office, which was a very good and important thing to do, he was getting old and there were other people he thought should, should run the country, uh, he stepped down. And Thabo Mbeki came in. Now, Thabo Mbeki was a very different kind of character. And here's a, something from very shortly into Thabo Mbeki's presidency. Phew. What is it, dear? I had a dream. In my dream, I spoke to Thabo in front of the whole nation. I told him, criticism is the lifeblood of the movement. Don't surround yourself with yes men. But Madiba, that's what you actually told him at the ANC National Conference in Mafeking in 1997. Oh, right, I did. Maybe he dreamt he didn't hear me. <laughs> Go to sleep, dear. <laughs> Tabo Mbeki, in that same year, became an AIDS denialist. He allowed the flourishing, and I'm not saying nothing started during Madiba's time in office, but Tabo Mbeki embraced a number of things that were about secrecy. He allowed the flourishing of secret deals. The, 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 the arms deal, the notorious arms deal that was notoriously corrupt began at that time. And as well as that, he was protecting certain people who he shouldn't have been protecting, one of whom was his uh, police commissioner, Jackie Celebi. And uh, there you see the Lion King co-starring reward-winning Jackie Celebi and soon featuring Jacob Simba in I Just Can't Wait to Be King. <laughs> Jacob Zuma, of course, and Jacob Zuma stepped into what I often refer to as the charisma gap. Thabo Mbeki was too aloof. So not only was he shutting things down, but he was too aloof. Jacob Zuma was a less aloof kind of person and he was more charismatic, and he was able to step into that charisma gap. But Jacob Zuma was tainted by corruption, and it was to do with the notorious arms deal. Now, while we were just figuring out that he was involved in this arms, in this arms deal, uh, his, his financial advisor, Shabir Sheikh, was in fact charged with fraud and corruption, and sentenced then to 15 years why was Jacob Zuma not charged with, with, along with the person who's supposed to have bribed him? So why you have a briber and a bribee? So that was a big question. When the verdict came out, the verdict, join the dots. There, of course, you see Jacob Zuma if you, do, if you do join the dots. And I actually keep all my little magazines and things from when I was a kid. So I actually figured out how you do these things. Make sure that if anyone did it, it would actually work. My, our son was old enough to do it, but I, 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 what I found really fascinating was that there were people, and I have this on very good authority, there were senior parliamentarians who were sitting in parliament with their <laughs> mail and guardian next to them and kind of doing this thing, which I, I, I was, you know, I'd always love to be a, a fly on the wall when these things happen or to have a little documentation of it, but it happened. So Jacob Zuma then not only is tainted by corruption, but then suddenly is charged with rape. Now... He was acquitted, and it's quite a long story, and I won't go into that story except to say that for someone, when, we, when I'm now looking, just looking at openness and criticism, Jacob Zuma decided immediately that he was acquitted, he decided to sue about seven or eight people and entities in the media. I, I was the biggest of the, the, the group in terms of the size of the lawsuit, 63 million rands worth of charges. Mine, 15 million rand. 15 million rand for three different cartoons. 
Now, that's a heck of a lot of money. It actually turned out to be a world record, not that it makes any difference. Um, but 15 million rand, the previous highest was, was, was half of that, like a million US. This is 2 million US dollars. That's a lot of money. Meaningless, though. Um, if it does come to court, I think that, you know, we'll win. But we don't hear much about this court case. But my first response, I'm suing for damage to my reputation. Would that be your reputation as a disgraced chauvinistic demagogue who can't control his sexual urges and who thinks a shower prevents AIDS? Of course, the, re the thing that sparked that comment was the famous uh, answer during his cross-examination in the rape trial uh, he, where he said you know, he had sex consensually with somebody who he knew to be HIV positive, but he wasn't particularly worried about it, didn't use protection, really, and then he went and had a shower, and he was asked, if he was asked what he did next, he had a shower. Uh, and why? To lessen his chance of infection, which was pretty amazing for a guy who had been the head of the National AIDS Council when he was deputy, when he was deputy president. So it became a big thing. Now, the shower suddenly was, in fact, the next cartoon I did, I, I left the shower off, and people, a number of people said to me, where's the shower? And I realized that the shower could... I suppose, become a fixture, um, which it, which it kind of has. So a heck of a lot went on in between that, this, this image and the next one. But then Jacob Zuma was trying to become president, trying to oust Thabo Mbeki, and in the process, trying to have the corruption charges shoved under the carpet or dissolved or whatever. And he was bullying and threatening the judiciary with the aid of a number of, of allies and I did a cartoon that was very strong, still is strong, and pretty shocking. Go for it, boss. This is in September 2008. Jacob Zuma then did become president. He actually managed to get the corruption charges wiped off. So he becomes president. The shower's now on his head. I think, okay, let me give him a chance. I don't want him to fail. I don't want his government to fail. I want to see this country succeed. So I thought, well, Give him a break. I'll lift the shower off his head, and I'll have the shower floating around. And if, if he does something good, then the shower will go higher. And if he does something bad, it'll go lower. I sometimes have a little scale. Uh, according to that, you know, if it really sucks, then the shower comes really close. And it, if it's really great, then the shower's kind of almost disappearing off the, off, off the cartoon. Um, and it worked very nicely and was a nice device. But within eight months, if you remember, suddenly, Two more, two more sex scandals, two more children out of wedlock, outside of his already three marriages. I thought, no, I, I can't carry on like this. I've got to sort of signal something. He does the State of the Nation Address, the big annual thing, his first one. And uh, I kind of, <laughs> I thought, no, it's enough already. And I did this one, which is my favorite one of that, that year, baby shower. Uh, <laughs> if you count them, they actually are 20, and, and believe me, people do count these things. Um, actually, I'll tell you something else. Uh, that's the official count at that point. Since then, people have done some more counting, and the unofficial count at the moment is around about 34, which is, which is counting some who we don't hear about that often, and yeah, that's quite something. So what were we seeing? Jacob Zuma, the man who was tainted in his coming to power, started to allow the flowering of corruption, the flowering of a whole lot of things that openness would actually help to get rid of. Uh, I agree. He, he should benefit more people. But I'm running out of relatives. And there you see the Zuma billionaires, sons, nephews, other BEE for anyone who's going to see this who's not South African, it's black economic empowerment, which should be a good thing if it were done properly, but it, it tends to be something that empowers a tiny group of people and some of them over and over and over, and the vast majority of people are left disempowered. There's democracy, and you see that little can of paint there is secrecy, and <whistles> Jacob Zuma is painting it out. And why have I done a cartoon like that? Well, clearly, for those of, of you here who follow things, you would know that it's about the Protection of Information Bill and about the Media Appeals Tribunal. A 
again, I can't go into too much detail about both of those, but the Protection of Information Bill would have huge jail sentences for people even possessing certain information, even if they were not going to publish it. Some of these things that are in the, the provisions of the bill have been worked on and worked on and worked on by pressure of, from civil society and from some opposition parties and from some people within the African National Congress and, and, there, and, and for, of course, a lot of pressure from media. And so things are kind of getting rolled back to an extent, but it's still there. And the other thing is that they have not allowed, and there's only been a little talk of it recently after huge pressure, is a public interest defense clause. That is one of the things we've been pushing for, to say that if you can show that it's in the public interest to have this information disclosed, I mean, are you going to still then jail me for having it in my possession or for allowing a newspaper to publish it or jail you know, an editor, a, a columnist, a, a reporter? So that is absolutely vital. And the Media Appeals Tribunal has been pushed back, I think, even further, but only through enormous public pressure and enormous pressure from civil society, from from these same kind of groups, as one of the, uh, one of the events happened in Parliament where, where, where the, the, the secrecy bill, as we call it, was being rammed through in yet another way, I did this one, which is a follow-on to one that I showed you before. Fight, sister, fight. There you see Lady Justice having had terrible things happen to her. That cartoon earlier was clearly she was about to be raped. Um, in it, metaphorically as a system by people who wanted to get to take power, Jacob Zuma and his, uh, his allies. And here, free speech is under threat as well. But this is a more feisty drawing. Free speech is not just, is not just taking it. Free speech is fighting. And free speech needs to fight. Now, as if to emphasize where we've gone, the bad, the bad ways that we've gone. We had a recent furore which I referred to earlier. Brett Murray, the, the artist who's a fine artist, not, not, a, not a media practitioner like me, although we have some similar roots. We happen, by the way, to go to the same school. I think I met Brett when he was eight and I was nine. He was always a feisty little guy. He was feisty on the sports field. Anyway, he did this He's, he's a fantastic artist, and he did a very powerful set of images which were in the Goodman Gallery in Johannesburg, and they were politically very, very um, critical of the ANC, but one, one image, not a cartoon, I immediately talk about cartoons, but one painting um, became such a, a major cause of, of furore that, I mean, I think people internationally all know about it as well. It was, it was a, a parody of the famous painting of Lenin, and the genitals were exposed. Now, it caused a huge furore. People went, it was about dignity in the same way that they had been attacking me. They attacked Brett. And that week, by the way, I think I could do almost anything. I could do anything. I just sailed right under the radar. <laughs> I did some pretty critical stuff. Nothing happened. Brett, poor old Brett took all the, the, the fury and the outcry and was taken to court. But the point about it is, one, the big thing that kept coming up was dignity versus freedom of expression. Now, both of those things are enshrined in the Constitution. But there are a lot of people in this country and in other parts of Africa who want dignity to be more important than freedom of expression. If you have to weigh the two up, I would, I would put it the other way around. Because dignity is a very, very subjective thing. It's... People who are complaining about the dignity of leaders being impinged are generally people who don't want to see criticism. The kinds of things that I've been talking about are an attack, the, the, the secrecy bill and the media appeals tribunal, the secrecy bill is really an attack on openness, an attack on uh, the publishing or, the, or the, the opening up of information by... And, we, and, and, that, and closing down that information would affect everyone in this country. And, that's, and it goes across the continent. And the Media Appeals Tribunal would be an attack on both information, the spread of information, and also criticism. So these two things are absolutely crucial. The one is mostly about information. The other is about information and about criticism. So when you get to the spear, 
this was a, focusing more on the idea of criticism, and it was about dignity versus freedom of expression. My response in the first couple of days was that one. With apology to Brett Murray, no apology to President Zuma, want respect, earn it. And there, what I tried to do was to recontextualize this painting, which had been decontextualized by taking it out of that art exhibition and making such a furore about it. You see that coming out of that shower, which I've, I've always been, I've always wondered about putting a shower in that position. It seemed so obvious for Jacob Zuma that it gave me the perfect opportunity. Sex scandals, corruption, nepotism, cronyism. That is what is characterizing this presidency and where South Africa is going at the moment. I'm not saying that that is the only thing that's, that, that can happen to this country, but that is characterizing what, what, where we are, which caused me to do a cartoon like this. Obviously a parody of the famous uh, ascent of humanity. It starts with the evil apartheid monsters, Verwurt, and then John Forster, and then P.W. Boerter with a wagging finger and the tongue, and F.W. de Clare kind of grudgingly opening up, the apex being Nelson Mandela holding that piece of paper, Democracy, and then a descent very fast to Thabo Mbeki and to Jacob Zuma. I cannot leave you with such bleak messages. I am pushing for openness, and that's what, that's what I want to see happen. So I'm going to bring you back to Nelson Mandela. This was done for his 90... 98th birthday. This is done in 90, <laughs> 1998 for his 80th birthday. Nelson Mandela, the early years. And there you see, what will I be? It's the little school in Klunu. And the teacher says to the principal, this one can't make up his mind. He put down lawyer, activist, freedom fighter, prisoner of conscience, president, reconciler, nation builder, visionary, and 20th century icon. Now, of course, I, can't, I cannot imagine that Nelson Mandela actually imagined he could become all those things. But it's kind of nice. You're having, I'm having a little in-joke with the, with, the, with the reader or with the audience. And, and just imagine, imagine during that closed period, during that time, in the, in the early part of the century, last century, when apartheid hadn't even been named yet, but black people were being discriminated against in the most vile way. And here was somebody who, as he grew up, started to get a vision of something better, and, and found ways to overcome that with the help of a, of a whole movement. That is what I would like to hold on to. And what he became, what he was able to do when he did, in fact, supersede, when he overcame that system, that is what I hold on to. And to have been a tiny part of it as well gives me courage to keep going. I'll, I'll tell you... I just wanted to show you one more little incident with, with Nelson Mandela, which also illustrates something about him, as opposed to the people who came after him. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Zen News, our uh, satirical puppet show. It's on the net with, uh, with, um, with caricature puppets. The first one we made was actually back in 98, 99. Nelson Mandela was, stepping, was just stepping down as president. On the day of his last speech to parliament, I managed to find a way to present him the, the, with his puppet, to, to actually introduce him to it. And he didn't know it was coming. He, had, he was not warned or anything. And I was walking around, and I was kind of doing the, the puppets, uh, doing his voice, and, and uh, the parliamentarians were swooning over the puppet. And I managed to fend off the bodyguards. And as I approached Nelson Mandela, he said, uh, Oh, I believe I've met this gentleman before. And I was, again, impressed so much with his sense of humor, his spontaneity, his lack of defensiveness, his embracing, as he had not that long before in that phone call that I'd had with him, his embracing of criticism, his embracing of satire, which is something I would love to see, and his embracing of openness. There you see government on the one side, crime and corruption on the other, and there's the media in the middle. Hear ye, the enemy approaches. Do, do, do. I hate this job. I don't hate this job. I actually love this job. But the idea that this cartoon is based on is the famous idea which actually existed in reality of shooting the messenger. Somebody brought you bad news, you shoot him. 
and somebody would actually be running along there knowing that at the end of this thing, I'm going to deliver the bad news that, you know, we've lost this particular battle, whatever, they'll kill me. That is crazy. Shooting the messenger is crazy. The messenger is part of openness. The media is part of openness. Civil society is part of openness. We need openness in South Africa. We need openness in Africa. We need to re-embrace it in this country. And I don't say it's the panacea. It's not the only thing that will bring real progress, but it will allow all the other great things that you've heard about today, the great ideas, embrace those ideas, embrace the idea of criticism in society, and that will take us a heck of a long way towards getting where we want to be. Thank you.